and welcome to the Diablo Podcast, your home for Diablo diehards, tryhards, casual, and hardcore alike. I am your host, Zant, and I am joined by my triumvirate of co-hosts, Nineball. Oh, hi. Words. Hello. And a special guest today, in fact, the focus of the podcast today, Mr. Harrison Pink. Hello. Now, uh, Harrison, you get the floor here. Oh, jeez. Who are you? <laughs> and why would we bring you onto this Diablo focused podcast? I've been asking myself that all day. Uh, <laughs> I am Harrison Pink. I was a senior quest designer on Diablo 4. I was pretty much there from almost the beginning, not from the exact beginning of the project. So, about six and a half years I worked on Diablo 4, which is not a small amount of time. Uh, so, I sort of seen it through all of its incarnations. I worked on the campaign, I was in the story room for part of it, uh, I worked on a ton of side quests. I did a lot of world building in Dry Steps and Hauazar. Uh So I had my fingers in a lot of the pies uh, across Diablo 4, mostly on like the narrative and sort of like environmental storytelling uh, sides. Uh, so I've been doing that for a long time, and it sounds like you guys want to sort of hear about that maybe a little bit. Absolutely. Now, uh, right. before we do that, I'm going to put you know these lore nerds on pause. Um, let's talk a little bit about your history. So sure. where, are you, where are you currently? Mm-hmm. Just out of curiosity. <laughs> I'm currently the lead uh, game designer at Cyan. Uh, Cyan is the company, if you know, uh, the games Mist and Riven uh, and a couple of the more, more recent games, Abduction for a moment. Uh, it's a it's a sort of um, adventure game studio that's been around for a long, long time, since the 80s, actually. Uh, so it's, it's a, quite a storied uh, place. Uh, and actually, Riven is one of the games that made me want to go into game development when I was young, a young lad. Uh, so it's kind of a dream to get to be a part of that team. It's very different from working at a 500 some odd sized team on Diablo to like a 30 person studio. Uh, but it's it's been a really great time. It's been a dream. I did some prior research and I did find an article you wrote in 2015 in which you said, I decided to major in 3D animation with hopes of one day working at Scion. I did it. I, <laughs> I go back yeah. in time and tell myself that I did it. That's that's pretty huge. I think like as I was going through and I was I was um, pulling things for the podcast here today. I think it, it's so cool to see that back in the day, you had this goal, and and we're going to talk a lot about the things that that kind of fall in between it. But here you are, and you have achieved exactly what you had set out to do so long ago, and that's awesome. That's yeah, awesome for feels you. Feels really good. Thank you very much. Yeah, it feels really good. Um, it's been an incredible time. And I, I, I think that deep down, I love telling stories no matter what type of game it's in. Like I've worked on Mafia 3, which was a large open world game, much more sort of action focused. I worked at Telltale Games, which was very, like the mechanics were just the story effectively. So I've always worked in different mediums and games, but I've always been a person who prioritizes the kind of like story experience for the player. Um, and so I've I've always like dug into the lore of I, I mean I worked on Tales from the Borderlands and I became like the Borderlands lore guy at Telltale. Uh, so whatever it is, I love to sort of like get into the backstory and figure out what made the world tick and what all the sort of like legacy stuff that the other games have already established that would be fun to pull out and uh, really kind of get my mind around wrapped around the world and the characters and stuff. But I've always really enjoyed the storytelling aspect of of video games. Um, I think. We are very appreciative of the work that you have done. In fact, thank you. Uh, th this weekend, and I'll share it with uh, with you too. I did. Uh, I stumbled across a four hour long video of the Diablo series. Uh, this oh. uh, video essayist, who uh, off the top of my head I am blanking on, um, basically chronicles the entirety of Diablo, um, providing you know some pointed critiques along the way. And one of the, the things that really stood out. Uh, as you get to the Diablo 4 section, you know, three hours in right. uh, was the uh, the commentary around the story and how it is probably one of the best in the entire series. And a lot of that, I think, is courtesy of the work and the world building that you and the team did uh, to really make it feel fleshed out. Um, so I was pulling quotes again, like I said, meticulously researching. And I like this one. I thought this was a good framing for what we can talk about today. In 2014, you wrote about themes versus mechanics. And you mm -hmm. said theme versus mechanics is fallacious. Uh, I believe it's missing an incredibly important third piece that changes the relationship between the two. And that is feeling. So 
Harrison, as we're talking about that. How do you think feeling was incorporated into Diablo 4? A great question. Um, I can't take really much credit at all for the main campaign, other than sort of being one of the small cogs in the machine. You know, um, when the creative director joined the team, he had a very specific vision about what he wanted to, the story that he wanted to tell, the very character-centric, very grounded story about the people in Sanctuary uh, that he wanted to tell. Uh, and I was lucky enough to be in some of the story meetings to help sort of like break down how that sort of story that he wanted to tell could be told through the medium of quests. Um, using the verbs that we have in Diablo 4, like there's only so many things you can get the player to do in Diablo 4. So trying to figure out how to like establish this sort of beats that, that he wanted to tell in this story. He actually wrote almost like a prose story. He actually wrote it like beginning to end um, with the characters. And then we had to sort of sit down and break that down into quests and arcs and from there, like specific objectives um, and make sure they all kind of felt different, but cohesive. Um, so I can't, I can't, and it was a big team. Like I had, we had a lot of really talented quest uh, designers doing that. It wasn't just myself. Uh, so I, I can only speak on that on a sort of like a, a, a very shallow level. Um, but when it comes, to, I, I'm happy to speak on side quests, which I obviously had a lot more control over when I built those side quests. Um, and one of the things that's really important for me is, as I said in, in that talk a long time ago, is making sure that the player comes away with a specific feeling that you want them to have through a combination of the story you're trying to tell and the and the mechanics that you have at your disposal. And depending on how much mechanic versus like story you have room for, you can kind of get close. Like I don't think there's ever any quest that I made where I'm like, I did it, I nailed the feeling 100%. Every human being that plays this is going to feel the exact way that I want them to feel. Um, but you can get as close as you possibly can. Like you can throw the dart and generally hit the, the target close enough. Um, and, you know, there's no way to get a player to feel a feeling. You can sort of help them towards a goal, but everyone's always going to have a different interpretation of the game that they've played, the story that they've experienced, and obviously it goes to the filter of your own experiences as, as a human being and, like, the biases that you have in your brain about interpreting the things that you're seeing and, and what's going on and what the meaning is. Um, so there's no way to like force a player to feel a certain way. And I think I did actually talk about this in that specific talk. I'm like, you can't make people care about characters. You can't just be like, you will care about this character because I write in the story that you care. Um, you have to sort of encourage them to care and like give them opportunities to to find things to care about in the characters. Uh, but it's not, there's no guarantee. There's a lot of people who play the quests and they're just like, boring, don't care, skip. Uh, and we know, we know a lot of people hit space bar a lot. It's heartbreaking, but we accept that, right? Um, so when it comes to feeling in a game like Diablo 4, it's really, it's tough, it's a balance, right? Because you want to make sure that you're not getting in the way of the gameplay. Like the core gameplay loop of Diablo 4 is very fast. It's an extremely fast paced game. And so to be like, all right, I'm going to make you sit through like a thousand pages of dialogue between these two characters back and forth to get this really deep story about like a girl and her mother. People are like, I just want to go kill demons, please just get out of the way so I can kill some demons. Um, so really trying to find a way to have the story be there if you want it. Uh, but not sort of like force you into interacting with it um, to sort of allow players to explore at their own leisure is is a real challenge. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, uh, but it's a, it's a it's a difficult and challenging one in a game like Diablo Four specifically. You think there's a, a quest that stands out that that you think does evoke that that it, that is able to get feeling across as well? I remember a, a long time ago, like around release, you had put out a great Twitter thread. Uh, going through that introductory quest as you're choosing which thing to burn and like the um, what you write on it. Yeah, um, and I mean, like I feel like that that is rather evocative. Um, there are other side quests off the top of my head, but I don't know what your involvement was. If so, I want to bring up, you know, the flayed man and the uh, fractured peaks. Mm -hmm. If you weren't involved in that one, but I did not um, get involved in that. But it's an excellent quest. Um... It comes up a lot, actually, in terms of when we talk to newer quest designers, like junior quest designers, in terms of you can make a really incredible, memorable quest that's like two minutes. You can make a quest that everyone remembers. And every, it's always on like top Diablo quest lists. Everyone loves uh, the the Flayed Man uh, Cenobite quest, right? Um, and we we point to that and be like, you don't have to write like a 15 hour like Final Fantasy VII magnum opus story to get something that's really memorable and really fun that people love. Look, you can do like one cool thing where you run in, see a crazy thing, kill a demon, and the quest ends, uh, and you can still have a really, really compelling quest. So I didn't, I didn't work on that quest, but it does come up a lot in terms of really explaining, like, hey, you've got to lean into the medium. You have to lean into the fact that the game is a, is going to be a certain way. You can't like 
pretzel the game into being a different game because you want it to be a long form storytelling game like let's say like the witcher or baldur's gate right like we can't really do what baldur's gate can do and if we try we just make a crappy baldur's gate and a crappy diablo we can't like get we can't make a good version of that in in the game that we have uh, so that that does come up a lot in that example. But to actually answer your question, um, yeah, I, I worked heavily on the prologue. I was we had like what we call a strike team, which is a sort of a multidisciplinary team of people that get together and really sort of like hone in on the exact experience you want. So in the strike team for the prologue, we had you know interactive designers, we had animators, we had uh, combat encounter designers to work on the boss fights and stuff. We had story people, we had, you know, VF we had like a whole little like little pod of, of experts to really like dial in everything. And it's funny that you, you bring up the, the the prologue because the prologue is like the slowest part of the game by far. Um, it's really slow. You get to kill like three wolves in like five minutes. Um, yeah. There's a lot of dialogue. It's slow, but like we did that intentionally because as you said, like we want to it's your first Diablo 4 experience. You've been waiting forever to play this game. We want it to be really, really clear what the tone of this game is, what the mood of this game is. Like, we really want to say this is not Diablo 3. This is not like super hyper hyperspeed game right out of the out of the gate, right? Um, and we had a lot of not pushback. We had a lot of people that were like not so sure about this across the team at the beginning um, because they hadn't seen it. We were just expressing the vision. They're like, yeah, but I just want to kill a bunch of demons, you know? And you're like, I promise you, you once it's in and you, you're playing it, you'll see it. You'll get it. Um, you'll get the feeling we're going for, which is like, you're scared, you're level one, you have like a basic attack to swing your wand at like wolves and wolves jump out from behind you and attack you. And it's, it's kind of scary. Uh, getting like horror or like scary stuff into Diablo, like Diablo ones, everyone always is like, oh, the butcher scared me a lot when I was a kid. And it's like in D1, everyone remembers the butcher running at you yelling fresh meat and you're terrified because you're going to die. Uh, but it, yes. you know, it's really hard in, in contemporary Diablo games, which is just kind of a power fantasy game, to find places for horror feelings. Uh, so the prologue was really the only opportunity that we really had to sort of like hem the player into sort of like not feeling powerful for a while. Um, like, like we're like, okay, we're gonna put a wolf here and a wolf here. Like we were specifically placing wolves. We had skeletons in specific places to ambush you. Um, and each one also at the, at, for the prologue like, had to teach you a game mechanic, right? So like we put ranged skeletons in front of the dungeon entrance so that you'll probably get hit by an arrow and you'll probably lose life and we can teach you how the potion system works. So it has to like pull like triple duty of like setting the tone, getting you to know what the story is and also telling you like how to, how to play the freaking game. Um, it's, it's tough. It's really tough and a really complicated, very uh, like crunchy game like Diablo to have room for just tone when it's like how do i open the menu and like equip my boots you know um so it's it's really tough to get that like the really prioritize feeling so you kind of find spaces for it when you can you know mm. one of the things i also really enjoyed about the prologue that you mentioned like the the um the pacing of it being like really slow because that is also just one of the most impactful kind of like um scenes that you have that like i like invokes a feeling uh once you're done with the dungeon and everything you go back to town where you know something is wrong like mm -hmm. as you go through and you're drinking in the bar is like this really is a setup to a horror movie isn't it mm -hmm. then of course then you get thrown onto the cart and it takes ages ages yeah. to get so long. into the cabin <laughs> so long yeah yeah there, uh, there yeah was... yeah there, there. I don't know what you can speak to or anything like that, but I know that there was one version of the game that actually had you walk by that uh, warehouse, you know, like the cabin that you're pulled into, on your way to the dungeon. But then the layout of the zone and everything like that was changed. And I felt like when when going through and playing through that version, when you walk past it, it's like there's no way to get in there. Something bad is gonna happen in that place. <laughs> I, I specifically like remember that as part of like the, the feedback and some of like the early testing yeah. um, was that I really liked that feeling. And I was sad that when like, I guess the topography was changed and you no longer were introduced, you just zoom right by it. You don't have yeah. that feeling of ominous. What's what's in the shed, you know? Like, yeah. Yeah. I, I agree completely. And it's just one of those unfortunate things of like, okay, well we had to do certain things for the story. So for example, um, the you wake up in the bar and you're killing a bunch of of the of the villagers which is horrifying right like it's yeah. not supposed to be a power fantasy you're like killing people with like names and like i bought stuff from that person like it's horrible right um but then you 
originally all the combat took place in the barn and the door was locked and you, the key yeah. you got opened the barn doors and then you and Yosef would like walk out and he'd tell you about what he'd seen and all that stuff. Um, but we wanted to have that, that combat beat be a little bit more substantial. So that's why you, you can open the doors and do combat in the open area, sort of like outside the, the front of the barn. Um, and uh, what's her name? Uh, 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 the uh, uh, Vani? Yeah. Um uh, no, oh. Vani, the, the 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 woman who gives you the quest, she has oh, to, yeah. she stands there with the bow and arrow to like shoot you, and she can't move because she has to like die to become a corpse. She can flip over to get the key, right? So like it's just a, it's like a it's like a list of like con- conditions and like dependencies. Like, well, we we can't let you leave the area because we could like you could you know kite them all the way down to a really weird place, and then they would die, and the key wouldn't appear. You could get into a bad state gameplay wise. So, but you do want to have more combat outside the front of the barn. So I guess we have to put up like a wall. And the door can't be opened. You can't leave that until Yosef like opens the doors for you to like go back into the zone. So the, it was a loss on like yeah you, yeah you can't really see the barn because it's that big fence. Uh, but because of the other story stuff we wanted to do to make the combat feel a little bit more beefy and for having more more combat outside the of the barn, we had to sort of like make that make that trade off. Amazing. When we all learn something today. Yep. <laughs> Games are hard to make. Is the yeah, answer right? <laughs> right? <laughs> Oh, I thought you just like threw it. You just typed some code and then it yeah. worked. And stuff yeah, you hit like the make that. game button, yeah. Uh, yeah. and that's why all game devs are lazy. Is you just have a make game button, you should just hit. <laughs> <laughs> There's a book, right? You just you just copy from the book. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's page. well. I mean, like, yeah. I mean, the prologue changed so many times because we knew it was like our introduction to the game that everyone's been waiting for so long. And it was going to feel very different, and you know, we we must have made the pro. I mean, I must have remade the pro like 30, 40 times. You know, we all worked, and not just me, everybody. We all worked on a bunch of different versions. We always started in the cave. You always walked into the town. The mm-hmm. early versions, like the door was like frozen. You had to like break the door down. People were like, "Well, that's your first encounter with a door in Diablo. Maybe you'll think all the doors are breakable." Like so we had like a lot of just like back and forth discussions about like if you if you're a Diablo purist, you probably know. Yeah, I know doors how doors work, but if you've never yeah. played a Diablo game, it's your first Diablo game. So we had to make a lot of decisions on it's onboarding new players, it's onboarding pre-existing like Diablo fans. Um, what are the expectations that you have coming into a Diablo game? Um, so it's it's uh, the, the opening of the game and the ending of the game are like the absolute hardest things to really nail. And I'm sure other developers would probably agree that like the first part, like 20 minutes of the first chunk of the game is like the thing you finish last, right? Because you don't know what the game's going to be until you get to the end. And then you take all those learnings back to the opening experience and then you can kind of polish it up from there. I'm like writing a, a paper. I, I'm an English teacher. I tell my students the exact same thing that you start with your thesis, you know what you're going to try and prove, and then you mm-hmm. do the body paragraphs and then come back to your introduction because you don't know what you're introducing because you totally. haven't written it yet. Um, yep. I, I think that's a, a cool perspective to have. Let's pause at the prologue because you had, a, I think it was a beautiful segue in there, uh, you know, and building up to what will be a return to Diablo. What was your Diablo experience? You know, growing up, uh, what was what was your experience playing Diablo? What was your Diablo prologue? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it also it similarly started in a frozen, cold, snowy <laughs> waste uh, of Ontario, Canada. Um, so I had never, I didn't play Diablo one. Um, I, so I actually I grew up in Bermuda, which is a very small island off the uh, eastern coast of America, and it's a British colony. It's like twenty it's miles wide. Small. Yeah. It's super small. Uh, it's like living in a very small town you can't leave, and it was a great way to grow up. It was a really fun place to play. You know, adventure your games and get lost and go on go in a rowboat and go to some other island like it was a really fun way to grow up so i have no regrets about it but getting things like comic books video games like like video game magazines it would just be whatever came in on the container because everything is shipped in right so you were like you want the next issue of game pro good luck like if you see a thing you want that might not get it might not show up um and same thing with comic books which is why i like it took me a long time to get into comics because like you were if you're waiting for like wolverine number seven you're like you might never get that one um and with video games. So I had a very small selection of video games uh, growing up. So I didn't have Diablo 1. I never played Diablo 1. Um, and I went away to boarding school in, in Ontario, Canada. And for the first time, I had like the access to every video game in like North, North America, like stores. Uh, and all my friends at the at boarding school were like, you, like Diablo 2 is coming out. Like, you got to, you, every, we're all picking it up. We're all going to play together Diablo 2. Like, we, you got to play this game. Uh, and I was like, okay, I don't know. Everyone's playing it. I don't know what it is, but I'll just buy it. Uh, everyone else seems to want to play it. Uh, and I installed it, and uh, I just go, Ugh. and it's like three years later. I've just been playing, <laughs> doing nothing but playing the game. Um, and so my first character was a necromancer named uh, Tiramisu, 
And all of my characters, every single Diablo character is always named after food since then. I don't know what it is. I don't know why. It's just been like, everyone has like their thing, right? So I guess I've always named my, my Diablo characters after food. I don't know why. Um, but yeah, and, and I just, I think I went full minion build because I was lazy and I didn't know how to play the game. So I'm like, y'all can play the skeleton play for me. Um, and so I've always been a Necro Summoner main, uh, no question. Uh, and then I played. We played multiplayer, and we played. You know, did all the PvP, and and I don't think we ever really got into like the deep, deep end game because I think I, as being a story guy, I'm like, well, the story's finished, so I'm kind of I'm out. I'll, I'll play with my friends to help them grind up and stuff, but I never really like went hard on like you know Malfail run, not Malfail, uh, you know, uh, meth, uh, meth runs or anything like you know Dario runs for stuff. But um, uh, I played a lot of that game, mostly just doing the story over and over again and, and seeing what new stuff I could discover. Um, but that got me through boarding school, so that was a thank you, big thank you to Blizzard North for that game. And then uh, any Diablo 3 prior to Diablo 3? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, a ton. Um, gosh, I was at Telltale. I must have been at Telltale 2012, so I was at Telltale when that game came out. Uh, and I remember, like, buying it immediately and it was way too hard and really like, and like the loot was really hard to get and like they, it was the auction house was still around um but at that point i don't think i had any friends that were playing diablo at the time so i just soloed the whole thing soloed the whole experience um and i remember getting to like act three or like late in act three and it was just so hard that i had to just like do the thing where you just grind a bunch to get levels and i'm i'm so bad at grinding i get really bored when i'm like i just want to do more story stuff i'm not interested in just like killing the same demon <laughs> over and over again so I put it down until they did the big patch that like made like the loot easier. They kind of like turned the auction house off and like they all the torment stuff. They like, fixed all that stuff, you know. Um, then I went back and I I plowed through that game. I can't remember. I, I think Witch Doctor was my first class. again because it was like the Necromancer, the closest like yeah. analogy to the Necromancer. So I think I played Witch Doctor main and then I think that a wizard and I played it again and, and then you know Reaper came out and. Uh, I think a lot of my friends were playing when Reaper came out, so I remember doing like the campaign multiplayer in Reaper, um, and it was like a totally different game. Like the vibes were totally different. And it was like really good. Um, I think probably played more Diablo two than I did Diablo three, mostly because I was like an adult who had obligations at that point in my life. But it was not a, a comment on like I, I didn't like Diablo three. I, I definitely put several hundred hours into that game for sure. So. You know, you, you've bounced from you know, playing Diablo 2, playing Diablo 3, and then you get to work on Diablo 4, and, and, and you, there's decades in between each of these games. Uh, is there a pressure yeah. that comes with that? Um, yeah, I think so, yeah. I've almost always worked on sequels. Um, not always. I mean, Telltale's Walking Dead wasn't a sequel, but it was based on an existing IP with a lot of fans, so... Um, and I was at that point a big lore nerd. Like I, I'd read all the books. I read, you know, all of the law novels, the main lines and more novels and stuff, and the Book of Cain or whichever was out at that point. So I was like really deep on the lore, and I felt pretty confident that I kind of generally got what they were going for. Um, and so I joined the team, and we were at that. It was so early days, right? Like we, the, I remember we were just working in Scotland, Glen, like Scotland. Glen, they had decided was like the zone we were gonna like mess around with first um and so we were just trying to figure out like what does a quest look like in diablo 4 what's the the main game loop what are the different systems that are going to work together like what are we taking from diablo 3 what are we taking from diablo 2 or diablo 1 like what's the vibe um and so i i honestly i didn't think about like the the like oh my god i'm gonna screw the legacy up i gotta make sure i don't screw this up i think that I don't think I was. I wouldn't say that I was like overconfident or like confident. Like, ah, oh, I, I got this. I'm not not worried. But I I remember just feeling really supported by the team. Like everyone around me were all, like even now, like the Diablo team is filled with extremely passionate people who love Diablo so much. Um, there was never a, a moment where I was like, I just I'm out here alone. Like I'm just floating out here. If I screw this up, I'm I, it's going to be my fault. You know. So um, I felt that I felt that just the pressure of being at Blizzard in general. Like I finally did it. I made it to Blizzard. Like this is like I may, I'm really proud of myself for making it to, to such an like illustrious company, making these games that I love. I played many hours of World of Warcraft. You know. So I just I just man, I was so happy to be at Blizzard. Um, I didn't want to screw that up. Uh, but I, I was just surrounded by such kind, kind and incredibly talented people that I was just excited to learn from all the time. And I was, it was like uh, the first few months was almost like summer camp, where I was just like just surrounded by incredibly talented, smart people all the time. And I just got to like learn the tools and just like come up with cool stories that I, I know weren't really going to make it into the final product, but just like stretching my legs. And so I was more focused on that at that time than like. If I probably stopped to think for long enough, it would have been like, oh no, oh no, we got to make sure we don't screw this one up. Um, 
but you know, I had a lot of faith in the leadership and they seemed to sort of like know exactly what direction they wanted to go. So like, that took a lot of the pressure off me. And it seems to have been a pretty good success. Um, <laughs> Depending on who you ask, <laughs> but I think so. I th I'm really happy. I'm really proud of, of a game that we ship for sure. I think uh, it is objectively at... successful. Like, there's yeah, no. That's true. There, <laughs> like, it is objectively like uh... like all the neckbeards can get over it because like no matter what beefs you may have with any system here or there. Um, speaking from someone who's played since Diablo one, since 1994, like I've played, I grew up with it. Like I've always played 96. Diablo. And... <laughs> the first one was 96. Yeah, it was 96. Yeah. Never mind. Um, anyways, I was you playing Paul. Stop talking. Um, um, yeah, 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 right. Yeah. <laughs> but the point, the point is though, is that like you talk about intentionality and the questing and the prologue and how much you guys iterated on that and went through it. And that I, it more than any Diablo game, despite what anyone says, that intentionality is throughout all of Diablo four. Um, especially in the campaign and all the side quests. And me and Nine have talked about it quite quite a lot about how um, the side quests are really the unsung hero of Diablo 4 for us lore yeah. nerds, right? They're there for us to go, you know what, you guys have fun with your grinding loop, and I love that stuff too. I am a grinder as well, but um, I love the side quests in this game. So to hear that intentionality, like it really, like I think it captured that. It did for me, for sure. I know it did for most of us. So yeah. objectively successful, yeah. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I, I, like I said, I'm really happy with, you know, there's no such thing as a perfect game. Ultimately, you run out of time, always. Every game I've ever worked on is like a sprint to the finish. Um, there was never a point when we were like, um, it's perfect. Like, we, we nailed it. Like, we know, we, I think everybody kind of knew that, like, yeah, we, we, if we could get more time, it'd be great. But, like, it's been six and a half years. It's been a long time on this game. Um, I was like please, please, like, we can continue to iterate on it. It's a live game. Like, we can continue to make it better. Um, but I think I think all the feedback and all the things people feel about it are totally valid. Like, I'm not here to say, like, it's it how you feel is incorrect at, in any way. Um, but I am proud of the part that I played in it, for sure. And I, I think you absolutely should be. Like, there's, you're absolutely right. There, there, no matter what, a game will be criticized in, in some capacity. I do think that the general universal acclaim, like the the criticism, wasn't on story. Yeah, um, no. yeah. Like the the story for Diablo Four has been amazing, um, and the fact that even just the little bits that we get on each season cause more questions uh, to come <laughs> yeah. up and create more conversation is a testament to the world building that happened within the story. Cause it's not just a, um, you know, like, Hey, this, this other random NPC showed up again. That's, that's our season theme. You know, right. there's like little layers that get to build off of the story, which is exciting. Um, now granted, I'm sure nine ball and Nerbert's have more in depth questions around that. I, I could go forever. Yes. <laughs> Let's go. go um, well, okay. So I guess, uh, I, the, the, the one question I'm really thinking about here, especially with you talking about intentionality, and again, like I, I come back to that a lot because that's really important, you know, like especially for a franchise that's been around as long as it is, you have to take very great care with what exists already. But obviously, to tell your story and to, you know, go down avenues you want to go down, there might be some things that need to change. And so I guess, like, I don't know what your level of, of uh, involvement with this part of the questing was, but there was two quests specifically, or two chains of side quests specifically. Um, I don't know their names off the top of my head, but I do know that, like, they they tied up loose ends in other Diablo games. Was there intentionality there to do that, or did they kind of like get born out of the process of creating the quest? And like, you know what? We could really tell the story of the Diablo II Paladin and what happened to him, and finally tie up that loose end here, or the Crusader story as well, right? Like, mm -hmm. both were very cool and amazing little surprises that if you don't go off the beaten path, you're not going to find it. Mm -hmm. And I love that because I remember like messaging Nine Ball feverishly, like in the middle of the night, be like, "Dude, did you see this thing?" <laughs> And he, you know, of course, he'd already seen it, but yeah. So yeah, I, I did it for you guys. It's just Thank for you, you. like you Thank guys. You. Uh, I so I was the same supervisor of Hawazar. So um, and obviously we had other talented. I didn't work on the Crusader. I didn't work on either of the quests, but I knew that I basically put a thumbprint down. I'm like, we're doing. Th this is the place to do that stuff. Nice. Um, so I, I, it was a, a other really, really talented quest designers on the team that actually did it. But I was sort of the, I was the point person. So I was the, to keep it really short. The zone supervisor sort of. I think you can think of it like the deputy creative director where like I take the creative director's vision and I'm sort of just like evangelizing it to the team and making sure everyone sort of like understands like this is what Howard's Art is about. Here are the theory, like the themes narratively. Here's the factions. Here's the towns. Here's the, 
each sort of like what we call sub zones that they're called regions in the game like here's the themes for each of them like they need to feel really distinct so that you when you're doing a quest near backwater it feels different than the quests at zarbon set right um but I, I, we basically make the box and then let the quest designers pitch quests. But a handful of them, like we're doing Linden's backstory, no question, that's happening. We're yeah. doing, uh, we're doing a Johanna related thing. It's not the Johanna from from past games, but it's maybe a Johanna, a Johanna, a Johanna a from maybe there's a relation. There's some kind of hook yeah. there. Um, that was that. It's funny that you mentioned that because that was like one of my things. Is like when they go through and they were talking, and it's like, oh, it's Johanna, you know. But then you get there, you get to the corpse, and it's like, wait, that's not Johanna. Yeah, right. so got dark like, hair. We but, intentionally but, picked know. a corpse that had dark hair because we were like, well, it's it's not that Johanna. Yeah. But who knows? They all share the same name, right? Uh, and right. so like getting out the the lore that actually that quest did double duty, right? It, it was a little little like wink to D three, um, mm -hmm. but it was also some lore about like how crusaders work, like the whole idea yeah. of the of the initiate taking on the mantle of the master taking the name of the master like that quest is kind of about that and like teaching you about the lore of the crusaders on like a wider level it was it was honestly it was just like so well done because like in the middle of the quest as you're going through and talking to her after as she like gets the art you like you find the the corpse and then you have to go into the dungeon to find the armor itself and when she puts on the armor her name changes so yeah, the, yeah, yeah. In, the, in the in mm -hmm. the dialogue it becomes johanna is like yep. so it's like you know just one of those like so yeah. cool. So you, cool. You, like, you have no idea how hard that stuff is to do in our game actually <laughs> i'm sure it's I'm actually sure really difficult imagine. to do that stuff <laughs> um but yeah it, that was exactly we're like oh like they are they have become that character right wow. um Very cool. for, for specifically for uh Karthus, um that was 100 percent me uh I, so um i remember pitching the idea of the black tomb to the creative director and like well we need it we need a b for donan this is the donan side of the story donan has to like try and do something with the soul stone it doesn't go well what if um he has to attune the soul stone to like mephisto's essence because a little to mephisto related um and that goes badly like he has to have a he has to have a stumble and, and fail for the story like the emotional arc that that the creative director wanted to put him on so i pitched like i don't know what if like what could he attune it to what if this is we know that the crusaders came to the east what if uh the crusader from d2 like took sankikor's body which is still like the the pope right and like yeah. hid it away but it's like radioactive it's got like mephisto radiation coming off of it so he like buries it in like a like a bomb shelter and just decides okay we're gonna stay here forever and, and guard it and that's the end of the d2 paladin then that'd be a cool story to tell and also like a tomb made out of onyx rad and metal um so i pitched it and they, and they were like yeah. cool that sounds great um so we we made the whole um the the keep also you can't tell this but the whole keep is off by five degrees or like 10 degrees like the whole thing is like slanted because it's sliding into the marsh you can't tell from the camera angle but That's it actually really cool. I, had, I had to take all the assets and like the waypoint and stuff and make them go like a little bit because they were like floating um but the the whole keep and all the story around that i really wanted to be about Carthus and the fall and all that stuff but what happened was it just ate all the air in the room from the Donan stuff. So we go into the tomb, and the, originally the skeleton in front of like the the, the 40k door, like the sealed wax door, yeah. was going to be Carthus' skeleton, and we we're going to he was going to drop a lore book, and he was going to tell you all. But like in that moment, that would have just totally been a complete tangent from the from the from the Donan stuff. And so the creative director's like, it just hey, we don't have room for it. We don't have room for like two separate stories. Um, so at that point, I said, okay, totally fair. This is much like the the, the grounded Donan failure story is way more important. Uh, but we got we got quest um, dollars to spend, and I want to make this. I think it's really important to get to talk about like people love it. When we talk about the D two canonical D two characters, and the Paladin is one that we haven't talked about, and it's the Crusaders, and it's like all this other stuff just lined up perfectly. So uh, I I worked with another quest designer and sort of like walked him through like I would really like to do a Carthus quest where you learn about that guy. Um, and you know what's actually here's a secret tidbit: um, the Carthus corpse in the dungeon. Uh, he was wearing like the, the paladin armor from like the start screen of D2. He's yeah. got like the, yeah. the shield, right? The heater shield. Uh, that corpse is actually from D2R. Uh, that we had an artist actually was able to pull the asset of That's the armor cool. and, and like swap him out and put a skeleton in, like kind of like upres it and make it look like it's from Diablo 4 and just like pose him on the ground. Um, so that asset we literally got because. Um, uh, the other team had been working on Diablo 2 Resurrected, and and we didn't. He just like, what if I just grab that and pose it for you on the ground? And we're like, 
amazing. Yeah. Um, and then later on, I think in patch one or patch or, or season one or season two, we were actually able to get the the heater shield. You can actually do a, a really short follow up quest to actually get a transmog that's like the actual heater shield from the yeah. from the opening uh, opening of the game, which only Necros can use weirdly, but hey, it's in yeah. the game now. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so it so, so it's a long story short, but like uh, I really thought it was important in the area where I could pull off those like lore pieces and not eat the space reserved for the campaign in side quests. Like that's the point of side quests is not to tell a bunch of kind of random fun little OC where I make my OC character up and like do some fun stories. It's like we're really here to support the world building that the campaign is doing yeah. and support the world building that like that's already there. Like we what I went into Hawazar knowing that the D3 Crusaders probably came here because they says they went to the east and this is the most eastern part of the world. Um, so that was like a, a, a legacy piece that we brought forward and we're like what already exists in the world that we should probably pay off here. So that's why the Crusaders are like bummed out, like war torn soldiers in Zarbenzet, because like the lore kind of assumed they were generally probably in this region, um, and and then it kind of spun out from there. Like, oh, this clearly was originally part of the Kajan, Kajan Empire. Like when the borders were wider, like it just it all just sort of like made sense. Um, so it's really important to side quests and not just be sort of like frivolous. You don't want to waste those dollars. You want to really spend them to prop up the rest of the what the game is doing. You know. And it's like for, you know, like a lore fan like myself, it's that interconnectivity, you know, showing that, you know, like there, there's there's a, a clear timeline. There's a, events and characters that continue to overlap and have impacts that kind of like span throughout the ages or, you know, at least until like the next title. You know, right. you can have the, like those little touches. And it's something that even is just like kind of like in the DNA of Diablo because it was in Diablo 2, like one of the biggest like things was the the fan theories and such of you know, Blood Raven, the, the Summoner, you yeah. know, and of the course, the, and all stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the Dark Wanderer himself was like, you know, you know, we got the, the canon story of that. It was the warrior became the Dark Dark Wanderer, mm -hmm. but whatever happened to the rogue, you know, and the sorcerer, and we got kind of got payoffs on those stories and such. So it's, it's cool to see that continue through, you know, uh, multiple titles. Yeah, absolutely. And, and like, you know, as I'm sure you know, like the FDD4 story is... is very sort of separate from the, the timeline other than like the Inarius and the Lilith stuff. And like the story is kind of not really, there's not a lot of connective tissue to D3 um, or, or the previous games because the creative director really had a very specific vision about the story he wanted to tell about the Haradrim and about your character and about Nate Rell and all these characters and really wanted to ground it in individual characters. Um, so really trying to find ways to, tie back into the larger sort of like Diablo franchise like story that's happening around was really important to a lot of people, not just to me, um, to make sure we, we didn't feel like we're telling like a weird little bottle story, like a bottle episode. We wanted to feel like, no, these are events that have been like in the making since like D1, D2, D3, you know? Uh, building on that, if uh, you don't mind me continuing the questions, um, like one, one of the big things that, I had a question when you're going, where you're talking about that, like, where it's kind of like its own little story, um, is specifically like the the use of uh, Lilith uh, and uh, Anarius. Like, obviously, with the intro cinematic, we have an understanding of how Lilith got back. But uh, I always felt that Anarius's return was always kind of like a little hand wavy. It's just, oh yeah, no, he's been back. He's just back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Like we, we, if if you know the lore, you kind of understand. Well, I guess. Mephisto and all those other people that would actually be watching over his, you know, prison are all dead or gone and such. But we never like kind of like got that confirmation of how did he get out, you know? Right. Yeah, it's an interesting one uh, because, and a lot of people are like, it's a plot hole. And you're like, that's not what a plot hole is. Um, yeah. It's it's definitely lore that we left intentionally vague, and the the, the game hints at it pretty strongly through like optional stuff you can like read lore books and you can read like uh see this, the, the paintings and stuff about like his his but we the idea i remember very clearly the idea was that we don't know the true story because all we have is a propaganda from the cathedral of light and that's kind of the more important thing to get out to the player is like they only have the story that anarius tells about how fucking rad he is and how great he is and how cool he just like <laughs> kicked all the demons in the balls and like shot back out of hell you know like he has a very specific story that he wants to tell and the fact that nobody knows the truth uh it was actually an, an intentional choice for the story um I don't disagree with you, but yeah. the other thing that's really important to remember is like there are there are lots of other ways for stories uh, from the Diablo universe to come out. You know, like there's mm -hmm. there's books, there's all sorts of different things that that the team, if they chose to do to to investigate that story further, we could do. Um, 
my head cannon was like my own personal head cannon was just that when the black soul stone was destroyed all of the like you know all of the the it sort of like just like shook things up and like there was lots of like crazy power struggles and stuff in, in hell and he was able to sort of like slip away because there was nobody watching him like he said and yeah. um i will say really 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 like pre this creative director joining the team's story we actually did go and like see him chained up when we actually rescued him um but that again like was a very very different story that was way more like diablo 3 like very high high fantasy very like big high concept sort of story about the big like war between the forces and it we just lost all the all the humanity in it and it was like the main characters weren't like Lorath and Donan, and it was like anarius um and it just didn't feel i think what the way that the creative director wanted it to feel which was like it's about the people um so i totally hear the feedback and you i've heard it a lot from a lot of people and you're not wrong at all about it um so whether or not you agree with this being the correct choice but it was absolutely not like it was like an oversight we like we kind of like chose to say like this is kind of a thing nobody really knows the truth of and it's something that that is kind of communicated in the game i remember we were having discussions in earlier episodes of the podcast um you know once the game itself came out how um the 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 scrawlings you know in the necropolis that you know yeah. that uh Daryl's mother is going through and putting down uh of Lilith's version of the story yeah. are very different from the paintings yep. in Anarius' sanctum that it's like they're both telling completely different stories you know yep. of how yep. they got to this point so yep i mean i love Anarius is one of my favorite characters his fatal flaw is he just doesn't learn a lesson ever right like, like ever, he never yeah. changes he like Lilith changes and adapts like she failed with Odysseus she like tries different things she's like adaptable and she's clever and Anarius is so freaking stupid he just comes back establishes the same church does the exact same thing like he just literally starts the same church up again um which i think is a is flavor text that i put on the um one of the unique items where he's like yeah he just came back and started the same church again that was step one for his plan to get back to heaven um <laughs> and i think that it's fun that like that's his fatal flaw like that's his like his shakespearean flaw is that he just never learns a lesson um and so he he yeah it's great yeah that's, that's like going back to like diablo one of you know like his story in the uh the the manual it's like he's always been like the archangel of vanity yeah yeah you know? that's good i like yeah. that i mean like you've seen that angel characters can evolve right like Tyrael obviously evolved a lot and malthiel obviously evolved a lot in a different direction um so it's not like there's always these stoic like unchanging beings but um I like the and he's also kind of a nobody. He's not in the Angiers Council. He's just a he's just a right. random soldier. He's, he's like a, a lieutenant. Guy. He's just a guy, just a dude. Yep. Uh, who happened to get his hands on the on the World Stone? So I, I love that he's just he's not like an important character in like the cosmology, other than getting his hands on the World Stone and creating sanctuary. Like he's kind of just a footnote soldier. Um, and I think that's I, I love it when it's not it's just some random character. I, I love when it's just it's much more lower to the earth, you know. Well, and, and I mean, I'll, I'm just going to throw this out there, too. He never learns his lesson, but I mean, just like the player characters, we also worship Mommy Lilith, so I get it um, completely. <laughs> I, I mean, let's mm -hmm. be honest, right? Um, mm -hmm. No, so... I, I was always Team Daddy. I'm just... I'm, just I'm never <laughs> Team Daddy. I'm not... I, if I had the, the robe, I would keep it and I would love it, but I would never wear it because uh, I'm not an Anarius fanboy. Um but he sucks. I mean, um, he sucks. Let's just be honest. He sucks. <laughs> yeah, he does. I mean, honestly, all of the angels suck. Um, it, for the true. most part, at least the demons want to use us. They don't want to just murder us all, even though they do it more than anybody else. But the angels wanted us gone, except for Tyrael. Um, but anyways, um, I have a, a question actually, and I don't, I don't know if you can go into this because this is a part. Because that's the tricky part is that some of this ties into like the main narrative and the main story as well too. But I know you did have, you know, you said you sat in on some of that stuff too. So I am curious. Um, cause you brought up some things that have sparked a lot of questions and one I'm going to say for the very end, but the first one I have, so me and nine have talked about this and there's been a lot of speculation because there's a lot of like vague, um, nuance and like metaphor through a lot of different conversations and side quests and the main narrative, but is how is our, I knew this was coming. I knew it was sanctuary, coming. or um, is it something else entirely? Because obviously yeah. the theory is that it's not. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, 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 I will say this before I answer this question. This is not a Blizzard canon official. Okay. I can't say that because uh, <laughs> okay. A, I don't work there anymore, and B, like the creative director might disagree with me. Um, so this is just me, Harrison, saying this. Uh, how is ours absolutely part of sanctuary? Like you, okay. you take your horse and you drive your horse from Kajistan right. across a bridge, and you're in, you're in Hauzar. Um, I believe it's supposed to be a bit more metaphorical about. The, so yeah. the idea behind the Tree of Whispers 
as from my understanding, being in story meetings with the creative director and with with folks, is that it is sort of a neutral middle party, like a third right. party that is does not really give a shit about heaven or hell it's it's like older and weirder and like and the intention behind this especially with like the giant snake and stuff is that like there's weird shit just in sanctuary there's nothing to do with the heavens and the hells it's just like sometimes weird horrible de- like deities and weird creatures just like appear and just like manifest themselves and they're unknowable and weird in that kind of like cthulhu way because what we don't want is that, like, if you just draw a line down the center and you have like good, like, like team blue and team red, um, everything in the game falls on one of those two. And so, and I think that um, the creative director really felt has he had a really specific like gnostic philosophy he wanted to pull from uh, in terms of like there's other weird things and humans are kind of bad on their own sometimes and there's no like right or wrong and things are muddy and weird and unknowable because if. If it was just, as I said, Team Red and Team Blue, you kind of, there is everything, you know everything there is to know about those two factions. We've kind of told you everything there is to know. So to sort of inject more mystery back into the world, uh, I think that was kind of the, the goal there is to just be like, there's old weird powers at work that have nothing to do with the angels and demons, don't care about the angels and demons, have their own motives. The Tree of Whispers has its own motive that we have no idea about, sends witches out to do weird things across sanctuary it's got its own like agenda that it's trying to trying to do and we don't we don't ever tell the player what that stuff is um it's actually to to, to pivot slightly really quickly it was actually really important to us uh to to, to the quest team and sort of the writing the narrative team to find spaces to re-inject uh questions into the world because it's really addictive to world build it's fun to weave something out of nothing and be like ah this thing it's this here's what that is um it feels really good to do that, but eventually you you fill in all the pieces of the puzzle, and you you just look, you stand back, and you can see the entirety of the puzzle. Um, and there's just no questions left. There's no mystery left, and it's like turning the light on in the in the monster movie. You can just see the the rubber suit. So, for example, like the drowned monster family, yeah. we at, at the, again, this is just that ship, right? Like at the, at the, during base village shipping Diablo Four, we made a very intentional purpose, like like choice to not tell you what the fuck they are. Like, what are they? Are they zombies? Are they creatures? Are they like? Are they are they building shit underwater somewhere? Are they? I mean, they're clearly like corpses that wash up on the beach. But like, why are they coming back as them and not zombies? Is there someone controlling them? Is there like a weird faction leader? Like, we had a lot of um, internal conversations about what that is, and I think there's a lot of understanding of what that is internally. But we were like, we're never going to tell you what that is, um, at least at ship, because. You just need a mystery. You need to not know what, because if you know, if you open a bestiary, you're like, here's what a goat man is, and it just like writes it all out. It just becomes like a fact, and it's not like, it's not a, it's not like a fairy tale anymore, right? Uh, and it robs some of the the sort of magic from the world when you can just like, oh, here are the facts, blah 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 blah. Um, so trying to find places with the tree of whispers to add a little bit more of that back into the world was the idea. But I do think Howard's art is in fact part of sanctuary. Awesome. Well, that's good to know. But I love the, I mean, I love the metaphor, though. I love the, like, the conversation because, like, the way it spoke about in, in that section of the game is very much like, what? who knows? Yeah, I don't know. Who knows? No, um, right? We yeah. don't know. And, and who knows what they, I mean, because with Diablo 4 being a live service game, I think the thing that's excited me the most is the ability for it to be a vessel for storytelling and sanctuary. And that is like, you know, what I love the most about Diablo 4 is, like, because, you know, like, we've had little things in the first couple seasons with, like, side quests, but, you know, once once we get everything where, you know, people on the team and, and outside of the team, you know, fans are all happy with where the game is at from an a end game standpoint, a loop standpoint, whatever you want to call it, um, then we can start seeing more of that that story yeah. pipeline in through little side quests, and, like, I'm, yeah. I'm so excited for Vessel of Hatred, because... Yeah. I mean, Mephisto is dad, right? I worked uh, on that one. No. Significant. I put a lot of... I, I was the campaign person. I mean, it's, I, it's all changed since I've, I've left. <laughs> I sure. can't take any credit for any of this stuff, but I worked heavily on the campaign, and it was, like, some really, really good stuff. And I'm excited. Oh, I'm excited. Play. Yeah, I'm yeah. excited. Well, that's a, well, that's a well, nice well, teaser for everybody there. Well, it's well, we're good. talking about... Well, we're talking about Halazar and things that are or are not in Sanctuary. <laughs> Is it Ure or Ura? I, I've always pronounced it Ure, but I don't Ure? know. Okay. I don't think we have an internal pronunciation guide, but a lot of that stuff is like, unless it was pronounced by a character in a game somewhere, it's it's, it's only ever been written. Yet. Yeah. Like um like Travancall has been pronounced in D two by by you know Deckard in Act three. He says Travancall. We have a like, record of how someone says it, so it's not Travinkle, it's Travancall or whatever, right? As an example. Um, but I don't think I don't think Ure Ure yeah. has ever been 
said. So I don't think there's any like correct way to say it. I guess when voice recording goes in that says that word, it will be like, that's the way it's said, I guess. Now it's canon. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now it's canon. That's how it kind of happens sometimes. Uh, so that's, wait for that one, I guess, whenever that gets pronounced. And we'll, we're all, we'll all be surprised, I'm sure. I, I have been waiting decades to go there. Like in, in a game, Diablo three teased me with it. They yeah. put it. They put it in the announcement cinematic in two thousand and eight. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like, oh shit, we're going there, and then yep. we didn't. And then yep. now I can stand outside the gates of the city, and I still yep. can't. Get it's in. so close. Yeah, no, I know. No. <laughs> we, we had a lot of conversations about your as as like we. It's there. Like it's if you look at the map, it's right there. Unless we want to push yeah. it a little further south across the river, but like it's probably yeah. there. Um, but we were like, what is it? Like, how do we pay it off? And it's also like, it's a big, the idea of Yure being like weirdly trapped in limbo. Like, how do we do yeah. that with our engine? Like, how do we actually pull that off in a way that's satisfying? Um, so we were like, do we hold on this? Do we figure out a way to do it? Like, there's tons of conversations about what Yure could be um, that I'm sure are still happening like now that I'm not there anymore, so I can't speak on that stuff. But like, we knew Yure was there and we couldn't just pretend it wasn't there. Um, so what can we do to at least acknowledge? Yep, we know we haven't forgotten. Don't worry, we know Yure is supposed to be here. Uh, but there's just a lot of really important questions on how to present it to the to the to the players in a way that feels uh, satisfying, right? I mean, I, oh. I've got a ton I could rattle off here, but I'm gonna yeah, let you yeah, just, so. just take it here. <laughs> Whenever you want, Xanth, just please. Yeah, continue. just l unleash, because yeah, I could go forever. Right. You guys are doing a great job on on grabbing these smaller pieces, um, and I think uh, no, you guys are awesome. Um, so in Diablo two, Diablo three, like the, the traditional quest pattern, you know, about six per act, right? And then we go to Diablo four, and that gets blown out of the water. Yeah, how hard is it to manage the the sheer amount of quests in this game? Uh, to make sure that they deliver, whereas any other iteration really just had to to lock in six of them, and some of them kind of sucked in general too. <laughs> but now you've got two hundred, yeah, and they're spread out over a massive world. How do you how do you how do you balance that? Are you so? Are you specifically calling out the campaign? The campaign uh, quests? No, I, I'm thinking more side quests. I mean, like campaign mm. quests, sure, absolutely. Um, like they're, they're integral, but they're easy to follow, right? Mm -hmm. um, the side quests that are built into every single zone are some are upfront, some are found. Um, yeah, you go find those to, things. Yeah, right. Uh, I guess. Yeah, how do you balance all the quests to compensate for the normal six that we would do? Yeah, it's uh, it was a challenge. Uh, it was a massive lift. We have a lot of like the quest team is just filled with extremely hardworking and talented people. Uh, is the answer? It's just like it's just legwork. It's just like hard work, uh, like like manual labor. Um, we don't have any sort of like radiant randomization system. Like every single quest is handmade. Um, so and every every single line of dialogue is voiced. We don't have the luxury of like World of Warcraft where they can just throw up like a, a text box and just like fill you in, right? Um, so there was a budget that we had for like how many lines can you get per quest. So um, the process. So I'm happy to walk through the exact process that we used as as a zone supervisor. I have I have you know insight into how we did this. So um, for, we'll use how as already as an example. Um, I work with a creative director. We sit down and be like, okay, what are the narrative themes we want for How Is Our? What are, what's the vibe, right? What, what's the what's the vibe check for How Is Our? And we'd say like, okay, it's it's swamps and poison. We have the Tree of Whispers. We have like witches and occult weird black magic there. We have these like snakes. These were mutated snake people. Uh, there are cultists that worship them. We have, like I said earlier, the the, the Crusaders are here. Um, we have like a sort of anti-religion sort of like push in one of the towns to the north. Um, we like we just rattle off all the like things that made Hauser feel like Hauser, right? Uh, and then we would take those and break them up per subzone or region and say, okay, well, uh, Zarbenzet is the main town, so that's where the Crusaders are going to be. So all the things in that subzone are going to be like Crusader requests, and they're going to be about the like the sad, broken soldiers of the Crusaders. Uh, Backwater is was my attempt to do a sort of like um, 
barter town, sort of like criminal town, but it's like their own rules. Like they, Super they kind cool, of like, by the way, like <laughs> I add, like that portion yeah. was like its own campaign for me. I'm glad. Uh, yeah. I'm oh, glad. Loved it. Yep. Loved I, it. I was really pleased with that name. I thought for a long time on that name and I'm like, that seems like a name that a bunch of criminals would call a weird little town Absolutely. that they built on the edge, like backwater. Sure. Um, the origin so, of the scoundrel. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Uh, we knew that we. Well, I knew. I was like, well, I want. We need a big boss. We need like a big boss criminal to run the barter town. Like, who is it going to be? And I was like, well, Lyndon is the makes the perfect sense. Um, yeah. Let's let's bring him back, uh, and we can see what he's been up to. And there was also uh, Lyndon quests that never made into D three that I actually talked to to developers who were on D three that's still on the team. We're like, what was the plan for like future Lyndon content that you guys never got to do about the the wife and the brother and the the kids and stuff. And so we didn't make the quest about that, but we like allude to it here and there. Mm-hmm. Um, so we you know like okay like we want to have the criminal town over here dealing with um like their sailor friends that are coming back as drowned up in the north we have the tree of whispers and i wanted that to feel like the haunted forest with like the weird like laughter in the trees and like the weird creepy haunted forest so we would start assigning the themes that we wanted to like areas right we would take two or three teams per areas or maybe like a theme for the town to kind of like anchor the town and what the town's all about all the side quests in the town um and then we would do what we we would actually scope the quest so we would have we'd say okay how long does it take to make a, a quest in diablo let's say it takes a couple of weeks to do like a like a standard quest in Diablo. We have bigger quests, we call them major quests, we have standard quests, we have minor quests, which is like the short kind of popcorn quests, you know. How many do we think we can make in the time that we have before we ship Diablo 4? We come up with a number, so just for example, two major quests, ten standard quests, or chains, standard quest chains, and like, or, or five standard quests, and then like ten minor quests, right? And then we'd go down the list of the themes that we had, and we're like, okay, well, the Thaisa, like, emotional, like, trauma healing quest is major. It's a major quest because it uses a major character, mm-hmm. and it's also like a big chain. It's like a beefy chain. We really want to give it the stuck, like the like the juice that it needs. The Kres stuff, the weird, like, you know, like Vine Man. Uh, we'll give him a couple of miners. We'll string them together into a cool quest. That's probably enough time to deal with like the one shot of like that guy's vibe. You don't need a ton of quests for him. Uh, like Crusaders, we'll do some single singleton quests to get the Crusaders vibe out. So we have started like assigning the, like how big is the narrative theme? How much room does it need to, to sort of like breathe and say, well, this feels like a big quest. It feels like a couple of small quests. Um, and then we would sort of like dot them around the map and figure out where we wanted this to go. Um, and then we'd assign them to the quest designers and be like, hey, like this quest is going to be about Lyndon's backstory. I don't know what that means. Like, like write a design document, hit these notes in the design document, um and sort of like sh- like a, a really simple map of where the quests might take you uh and like see if there's any cool pois that the artists have already sort of like placed down as an old like ruined chapel you can put the quest in or whatever um maybe send it in that direction uh if you need like a cellar or a dungeon or whatever we can talk about like how many dungeons a quest might get or whatever um and then we just asked them to make it and we just play it. And so we, we also had a, a, we used a program called Miro, which is like a shared whiteboard app on online. And we had a big master map of like the entire game. And we had like arrows going from each like quest start to quest end in like Hazard to be like, oh, like, like all the quests in this area are all going to this like one POI. Like we got a, we got a traffic jam here. We got to like spread this out. Or like this corner down here has nothing. There's nothing in the fens. We got to put some quests in the fens. We got to, maybe we'll move that snake quest down to the fens and do it down there instead. Um, and then from there, we just kind of like let the designers own it really um and we just play tested them together so we what we definitely didn't want was like every single quest starts in a town we definitely wanted the like you find a person out in the field and they're looking for their mom's house um and so we just said like hey you know it would be great if this quest started somewhere in the field because we already have like three quests to start in zarbonzet um and we would just check in with each other right uh, to make sure that we weren't all making the same quests and all going to the same location so um that's kind of how it worked. And we just we would just have to do like quest team play tests together to make sure we were playing each other's content, giving each other feedback and being like, oh man, you know, like this quest has a similar beat to my quest. Maybe I should change my quest to make sure that it's not like another quest where somebody's cousin has gone missing and they're dead in a field somewhere. Because we, we have a lot of those. Um, how can we how can we like make sure we're all hitting different different beats and different notes or like oh this quest is like too many beats where you're talking to someone in a row like maybe throw in like a, a zo- like a zombie ambush in the center to like give you some action here to make sure it's not just like one note you have some high beats and some low beats and or like oh you're trying to get a character to like tell me this really important story thing here but i'm getting attacked by goatman and i can't really pay attention to the story uh, maybe build a quiet beat in here where you go to a safe place you go back to town so you can have a moment of like like R- rp in some like theater that you can do safely before you go back out into the wilderness to kill demons and stuff again um so we would all just sort of like 
work on the quests together and keep in touch with each other as it all kind of came on on board and different quest designers would have like uh, you know a couple of people worked on fracture peaks a couple of people worked on how are etc etc and we didn't really mix the mix the pots too too much like sometimes you'd be like i need to do something besides a snow quest please can i do something in kajistan um but for the most part like we had people like dedicated to those to those zones hmm. So, but Sounds, to answer your question, uh, a lot of work, just a lot of work. Yeah, a lot of work. Yeah. No, I think that's always uh, super interesting to kind of get an idea of what's happening behind the scenes. You know, uh, obviously my experience is only on the player side, right? Mm -hmm. um, I just get to play the finished product. I have no <laughs> idea how the sausage is uh, is actually being made there. Um, it, yeah. it's, it's also just really interesting going through and hearing that you're like trying to attach like quests and stuff like that that like the artist team had already like kind of like put those points of interest you know in in the game itself mm -hmm. but just like random doodads and stuff and you're like i should put a quest it, there it's a leapfrog there... right so like yeah. we we uh we couldn't the quest team is later in the pipeline a lot of times or like mm -hmm. it takes a long time to make a quest and people we the the and sort of the like environment artists would be like hey like give us a list of pois that you want and sometimes we're like, okay, well, obviously we want like this, this, and this. Like we know early on we we're, we're going to want a couple of things like this. But a lot of it's like we have empty spaces, and like you guys are artists, like we trust you, make some dope stuff, and like we'll use it. Just I need like an interior. I'd go into Zarbin's and be like, I need, I need like two interiors requests. Um, wow. But ultimately, like we would leapfrog each other. So we'd have like a, a the campaign would be earlier. We'd know we need some POIs for the campaign, and then spike quest would come in. It's like, oh, you know, um, the Taisa quest needs a dungeon entrance here or whatever. Um, but other than that, it's like, I, like just you guys have to kind of continue doing your job in front of us sometimes. So we will have to come in later and just use what you guys have given us. Just kind of make sure that the combat spaces are, are okay. Like they're big enough for combat. Um, like, uh, hey, there's some ruins here, some old Crusader ruins. Well, we'll definitely use those. We will, we will want to send people to them. Like, um, I often say that there's two big things that side quests are intended to do in Diablo 4. One of them is to send you to interesting POIs. Um, that are important like world like the statue of tybalt right like the big headless statue yeah. um which which we knew we wanted we want like a crusader a failed crusader like an example of a failed crusader monument and like that went in really early we're like well we want players to see that you might never notice it otherwise so we want to send you there specifically and the other thing is to like as i said earlier like really expand on existing world building beats more about like the, the factions and the characters and stuff so if there's art that really sells like oh this is all about the drowned like weird head statues that are like buried in the ground coming up out of the ground or oh this is like a old uh, uh graveyard and all the all the, the water tables so high that the graves are popping out of the ground and stuff like we want to really bring people to those locations so it, it's absolutely kind of like a, a symbiotic relationship All right, I got my question, and now you guys go. I mean, I I have uh, I mean, nine. You might have the one the the questions I'd answer. I don't think you're going to be able to answer, even well, if you, you know can, the answer. Well, let's let's see. Let's try it. <laughs> All right. All right. Fine. So, Hawazar, uh, you have to have gotten this question before. So we're in Hawazar, right? There's the witches, right? Which feel oddly adjacent to witch doctors, and then also swamp. Um, you know, but obviously, you know, we've kind of confirmed that that's not really where the witch doctors come from. We know where they come from. Um, so but it felt right. very witch doctor adjacent. Um, but then on top of that too, you have the, the big elephant in the room or the big snake in the room. Um, Tragul exists, <laughs> right? Yep. Tragul exists is giant balance snake. Does I mean, he? dragon obviously, but does he, who knows, who knows, well, well, who, mm, who knows? I, I've, I've gotten I've gotten that answer before from previous like creative leads yeah. and such. <laughs> and that's why that's why I'm saying is like like you're talking about being vague intentionally, so it kind of leaves room for them to like kind of tell the story mm -hmm. they want to tell when they want when they get to that point. So that's why I'm saying like my questions are probably all gonna fall in that category of like they were intentionally vague, but that felt like at least Tragul adjacent, similar to the witches and witch doctor adjacent. Yeah. So. The witches and the witch doctors are totally not related at all. Not even close. Okay. They're 100%. Whoop, um, the witch, their being witches was a thing the creative director was like, day one, how is our, I want witches here. Um, like classic medieval fantasy witches. That's what we want. But we want them to be neutral. They're like morally gray. Um, they have their own thing going on. They're not witch doctors at all. They work for the tree. Um, and that's what I, when I did the, um, 
the heretic quest line it was about mm-hmm. you know I, I put a lot of like emotion personal emotional stuff into that about like escaping from a, uh, an abusive relationship but it was also to teach you how like witch culture works which is like you don't get to choose if the tree's like that person you're going you're a witch that that's there's no conversation um and they have like an agenda and they kind of like keep the swamp safe for the tree right um so very different like the the witch doctor stuff um from um from uh uh what's the area called um umbaro the grasslands uh, uh umbaro thank you god yeah. woo the umbaro um very different cultures not related um but maybe at some point someone's like oh you know maybe they like there was some cross-pollination like like cultural maybe they they talk to each other but whatever but, right. but when we built the witches uh it was 100 percent like no these are how is our witches but we i actually tried very hard when we made the like so we made um um gullius and and zerk 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 um and they come from different places. Like, like Gullius is very pale, right? She's probably from the Fractured Peak somewhere. Um, I wanted Zerk to be sort of like olive skinned, and I think I mentioned that he's like he was like a homeless kid in like in um, in Kajistan at some point when he was like he was like a cut purse like kid and like a like a you know. And then like he was called, and this is his life now. Um, so they come from all over the world. It's not just Howazar, but they now have been brought here. Right. Um, so they're it's a very very different culture. Uh, but for the snake stuff, it's funny because there was earlier dialogue where um, I think like Lorath said something like, "Oh, I'm gonna follow Wrath with Snake," and I'm like, "You cannot say Wrath with Snake because people are gonna be immediately be like, that's Tragul." Um, right. Yeah. Uh, we said that I, anyway. I, I think you <laughs> it. It's not, it's supposed to be like the snake that Rathma saw or Rathma followed or whatever. It was that like that's the snake of Rathma, but it's not supposed to be like Rathma's snake. And so like I I tried to change it, but I think like it was just too late in the process. Um, well, I mean, but you also you stare into the scales and you see like potential time. You see weird shit. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. That, which is also another trade. It's a multiversal a snake of, now, yeah, right? Yeah. Yep. Hey, so. <laughs> so we. First off, there's no dragons in Diablo until there are, until some like shop armor says that there's dragons in in Diablo, and you're like, I guess there's dragons in Diablo, but like clearly early days people would be like pitching stuff and like there's no dragons in Diablo, like there's never been dragons in Diablo other than you know Tathomet, which is not really in Diablo, but like um, in like the actual like in Sanctuary there aren't dragons. It's not like that kind of fantasy game. Um, So the idea of like time dragon. It, to me personally, again, just speaking as, as Harrison, like, and it was always like really weirdly antithetical to like the grounded, weird medieval horror darkness of Diablo. Of like, oh, there's actually a secret good guy out there watching us and making sure it all goes to plan. It just felt weird. Like all the Anu Tothamet stuff is really fun world building, but it's just like mm-hmm. it's so like it's 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 a fun fact to learn, but I can't emotionally connect to like Anu. Like it's yeah. like, it's like God. Like how do you connect to like so whenever they're like, Oh yes, there's a secret dragon out there watching the timelines and stuff, it felt very World of Warcraft in a way that um just felt different than like the tone that Diablo was trying to hit. So my own head cannon, entirely my own head cannon, or a couple of people on the team's head cannon, uh, was that maybe, maybe like uh uh, uh Tregel was like Rathma's like other personality, and he was like almost like talking to a, his himself. Like he like and he needed a, a smart person to like bounce ideas off of, and he like fucking like manifested a crazy like, star dragon to talk to. Um, that is not supported in any way by Blizzard, but I just <laughs> what I imagine it was like. How do we, how do we like I love that theory, oh. how do We sunset like Tregul because no one can pronounce his name, no one gets his name right. We always like had this argument about how it's pronounced because old games and the spelling errors. Oh god, what if we just like yeah. sunset Tregul? Um, that did not happen. Happen. But uh, I I've always felt like that those those like really high level like astrological like world building and ending stuff is like it's fun to read in the back of a manual but like it's not a story you can really attach emotion to so yeah, sure. generally want to push away from like the god beings because then you ask questions like why aren't they helping out you know like I actually remember writing dialogue in uh, the the by three day come quest when uh, the like one of the Rathma buddies shows up and like harasses Elias. And and he's like, you can't, don't mess with the balance, man. And Elias is like, where's your, where's your boy been at? All these times that the gods, like the, the Diablo's shown up and like wrecked house, and he's just sat there watching it happen. Like maybe your guy sucks actually. Um, I think they they revved that out of the dialogue, but that was the intent behind that scene where Elias is like, mm, no, Rathma hasn't done anything to help humans, so I'm gonna do it actually. And you're like, he's not wrong. Uh, yeah. so trying to bring it back to like the people has always been the goal of of, the, of at least for Diablo Four's like core story. Makes sense. Which brings yeah. me to my next question that you probably can't answer due to vagueness, but material. 
Yeah, what about him? Good question. I mean, like, okay, like, Good we question. know it's very vague what happens, and there's different kind yeah. of takes on how it happens. But obviously, Tyrael has been such a huge part of the lore and, and the, the your 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 player character's lore throughout all of the games. Yeah. Um, I like the idea to steer away from Tyrael because it felt very different and apart from what he's done. And and while I love Tyrael, I think we all got tired of, of human Tyrael in town just talking about how he'd eaten too much uh, for like 10 years in Diablo yeah. 3. Uh, which honestly kind of sucks because it made him a meme a little bit when, you know, it's Tyrael, dude. It's fucking Tyrael. Like, it shouldn't be a meme. Um, but at the same time, right? Like... Is it the same kind of principle that you applied to Tyrael? I mean, obviously, uh, I you know, wasn't really involved in the side quest part of it as much, sure. but do you have any insight there? Um, I obviously can't say what the plans uh, for all the characters that we haven't talked about in the game yet. I can't speak to that. But what I can say is it's it. we really actively try to avoid the temptation of just like throwing all the action figures in a box and be like, yeah, action figure. Like, everything's yeah. here. All your yeah, favorites yeah. are here, baby. That's um, a great way to bring that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that makes sense. So like, yeah. it's, it's like what, what you in- instinctively want as a fan and what's good for a story is not always the same thing. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people early on were like, I just want to get on a motorcycle with Kirill and kick some demons in the balls and just shoot guns in the air. And you're like, yeah, but that's not the story that we want to tell in this specific game. Um, and yeah, we have I to make... I will buy that game. I'm just... I would I totally <laughs> buy that game. I totally sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you might have to make it yourself. Uh, that's fair. The, uh, we, are, we have to make the best choice for this specific game. Yeah. Um, we have to make the best choice for Diablo 4. Not worrying about future games, not worrying about the past games. Like We have to make the, the calls that make this game as strong as it can be and the creative director had a very specific story that he wanted to tell um and this comes up with a nephilim too and i i don't know if yeah. that question's come out i'll answer it too yeah. like once again like the nephilim suck all the air out of the room like how can you have a story where the nephilim just show up as bit players they're like gods yeah. like how do you you know they they would just steal the spotlight immediately um it doesn't mean we've forgotten about them it doesn't mean we don't talk about them um we're not intentionally like cutting them out because we don't want to use them or we don't they're not important but like there was a very specific story that we wanted to tell about the human beings of sanctuary and we just didn't have room for characters that were so powerful or so like lore important to like how why would you listen to lorath talk at all if Tyrael's also there right no that's a very good point that is a very good point and also Tyrael has like prescient information where he he would just tell you all this lore about like stuff when you needed to like go into like tombs and stuff and find it um, and it was intentional that Lorath felt very different from Deckard Cain because Deckard Cain's like book guy and he has all the book lore and he's all in his head and L- Lorath is like out there like beating his, beating the, the the pavement and like making connections with people and talking to thieves and like like greasing palms and like that he's a very different kind of Haradrim mm-hmm. um, and so we we yeah we just felt like you know we, Tyrael came up a lot and and there were definitely versions of the story that had him in there and it just felt like we're just doing this because. Yeah, he's Tyrael. Like he had to. He doesn't yeah, actually fit in the story. Sense. He just feels like we have to have him, uh, and it honestly felt like doing him a disservice. Uh, so again, I can't speak to the future, but we, the team knows, we we all know that those characters are still out there. Uh, so, but yeah, for this for the very specific story that shipped in D four, it just we just couldn't fit them and didn't really do them justice. And 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 just like I said, right. He's not going to be able to answer these questions. Uh, I do appreciate the insight, though. The insight's almost just like that's valuable. an okay answer. I can't, no, I can't it's answer you. Know, it's a not, it's great not answer. An answer. <laughs> but, you know, it, um, it's, one, the, it's one of those things that like people need to actually go through like um, and acknowledge. You know, It's something that comes up like all the time in like, superhero yeah. and comic stuff. It's like, who will beat who and such. It's right, like, yeah. People have to accept that the answer is whatever the story dictates. It's, you know? yeah, it's like, right, that's, yeah, that's correct. really what it comes down to. It's, like, yep. it's just... It's what's the lore answer? The lore answer is vague because the story dictated that he it was better off for him not to be there. That's yeah, that's right. that's what it is. Yeah, and, and honestly, and like a lot of times you don't want to do the thing that's like lore cute. Like we could have packed this game full of little winks, and like like the lore nerds like us would have been like, yeah, you guys get it, but like. Is that a story? It just feels like it's just a box of references. You know, we didn't no. want to just remember make... berries. Yeah, we just no. wouldn't. We didn't want to do a box of references. We wanted the story to stand on its own. If you, especially if you've never played a Diablo game before, we really wanted to capture a new audience with this game, right? So if you come in and it's all like, let me tell you all about Tyrael and stuff, uh, you'd be like, I don't know what is happening. So like, if in the prologue, right? Like there is a sequence when we introduce an Aries at the statue. It's all broken, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, we have to be like, hey, if you don't know anything about the Eternal Conflict, here is your like three sentence primer of what the Eternal Conflict is, because you're going to hear it a lot. You actually do need to know what this is. So like coming in on the fourth iteration of a game 
and being like, there's a crap load of lore you have to know, it's really off-putting for a new player. So trying to find a way to like onboard them in just the stuff they need to know, uh, just so you have the context of like what's going on in the world, while not like dumping, I call it, what well, we call it, the um, dumping the bucket of proper nouns over people's heads. Like immediately after like all these people's names, like the, the duchy of this 20,000 years ago, they did this and this character did this and used this magic spell to make this thing happen. And you're like, I don't, I, your eyes just like glaze over and you're like, I don't know what is happening. So really making sure that we like drip fed, hey, here's who Lilith is. Here's what she, why she matters and what she's all about. Here's who Anarius is and what the eternal conflict is all about. Like that's why it doesn't start. The opening crawl has like nothing to do with any of that stuff, right? Yeah. Um, so it's it's tough to tell a story where you there's like all this lore that you have to deal with, but you can't really be shackled by it. Otherwise, you're just going to keep drawing the same box over and over again, and people are going to be like, just Diablo Four just felt like Diablo Three, which felt like Diablo Two. Like you want to break new ground. That's why like, we introduced new yeah. characters like Donin, Narell, because it could have been easy to have no new characters and just be all familiar faces, and then you'd be like, why did I spend money on this game? It's just the same story again, you know? No, that that's awesome, and I think you, you know, the team did a really good job with that. Like, again, I still... Uh, you know, Diablo 4 is the most robust uh, and engaging story, I think, that of any Diablo game. Um, and I love Diablo 1 and Diablo 2. But those stories were really just text in a box that you could just yeah. if you wanted to and just move on. Um, you know, a lot of it came in the books that we read. Uh, you know, that that was really it. And that's where you got that deep dive lore. So uh, that's that's what turned me from, you know, normal Diablo player to like, you know, forever nerd. Um, <laughs> but the last one, and this is the last question, and I've just, I've got to ask you this because you're like the most... But the closest thing to an authority figure on the matter, even though you probably have zero to do with this at all. Harrison, am I a vampire? Oh, I don't know. Are you? You tell okay. me. That's it. Yeah. So, so okay. I, I will, I will, again, <laughs> once again, I will give you my Harrison personal opinion on, on seasonal stuff. Um, I personally, again, not a representative of Blizzard here. I personally believe that, and I would fight in meetings about, uh, seasonal stories should be bottles. They should just be a bottle. Like when the season ends, those characters go away. It doesn't mean they're not canon, but because they go away, you can sort of mentally distance it from like the rest of the game. We're like, yeah, like Varshan is real, and all the stuff he did with uh, with 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 his buddy like happened, right? Like right. that stuff doesn't just delete. But like, it's not quite canon. It's like not canon, canon, but it's canon, right? Um, because it ends. Uh, and there were a lot of discussions about like bringing back other characters. And you know what? Maybe that'll still happen. But like at the time, there's a lot of discussions about bringing back seasonal characters to be like in the, the eternal realm eventually. And I would, I personally was like, I don't really want to see them. A because if I didn't do the season, I won't know who the heck they are. Right. Yeah, um, get and we don't want to have like the enti- entire intent behind seasons is like you don't have to do them all. If you want to, if you want to take a break, that's okay. You don't miss any of like the really important ongoing story. And if we start to break down those barriers a little bit, it starts yeah. to get you get a little bit of that FOMO. Um, so I was like, I really don't want to see, uh, uh, what's his name? Cormand in, you know, uh, in Fracture Peaks a couple of weeks from now, a couple of months from now talking about like, yeah, thanks. Remember that time we did that fun thing together because right. it starts to break down the boundary between the season and the, and the base game. And the lore, and I right do now. believe that. Yeah. And then like, I, like I said, it's absolutely canon. Like it absolutely, that stuff happened, but there is like, um, suspension of disbelief that you can be like, well, it ended the season went away. So maybe it's not quite canon. It, it's, there's kind of a mental reset that you do, um, like an emotional and mental reset you do where like you kind of just like let that stuff go as a thing that happened in a weird little vacuum, like a weird little like like side dimension. Um, and it's also like the idea of the Jenga tower of like all the bosses that are like all the threats that show up after like 12 seasons or whatever of like, oh, there's just infinite other horrible monsters out there. Like forget Lilith, there's like 12 other things that are trying to kill us and like trying to remember all of them and why they were all doing their thing. Like the idea of the reset where you're like, cool, like Zier's out of Zier's done. We don't have to worry about Zier coming back and being a thing other than a boss ladder guy. That's like I can emotionally sort of like like let that go and free that space in my brain for the next season. Um is actually what I would argue is actually really important. Do other people on the team agree? I don't know. But right. I think that I think that to answer your question, like I personally would be like, no, that would happen in like a weird pocket dimension. Uh, but I I couldn't answer that with any sort of authority. Awesome. And and yeah, and I want to apologize for everyone for the last 15 minutes. When I told you he would not be able to answer, but your insight was really really <laughs> valuable and really cool, Harrison. I mean, like, I again, like, like I, 
I honestly was expecting it when you said like your very first question that you were gonna ask him if you were a vampire. I was, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm I've been glad, wondering that I'm for months. Like, am I like? Because yeah. you know, I, I was a I vampire least... and I leveled up as a vampire, and then I just sure. wasn't anymore. And now well, I've got, got the boots. Boots. rings now, so you know, I've got vampire I'm, I'm, boots. Yeah, it's yeah. true. So, I right. I think that at least I hope it gives some insight into how sticky development no, of sure. video games is. Uh, and it's and not a thing that we go into lightly. You know, like there's a lot of thought that goes into these kinds of kinds of decisions. Yeah. That, that's my thought too, right? Like, if in my head canon, it just it goes in one ear out the other. But then, like, like Zier specifically, that's a really cool origin yeah. for a character, especially how that is, ties yeah. into the first yeah. ones and all that stuff, and, and or the Nephilim, whatever the hell we're calling them now. Uh, but it's really interesting. Um, so, like. Yeah, I don't know. It's just wild, um, and very excited to see where you know all that stuff goes because yeah, yeah. Again, while I know we are the minority, and there's a bunch of people out there rolling their eyes because we're not there's talking about game systems and dozens, loot, whatever. Uh, there's at least there's at least a few on this podcast, and and I just. I love the story of Diablo. It's what gripped me. Like the gameplay loop can be mimicked and, and imitated by any other game, and that's fantastic. But I I play Diablo because I've always loved the lore and the story of Diablo and the world that's that's created there. So thank no you uh, for, oh, for answering those. Yeah, yeah of course. Sure. No, I'm gonna I mean, jump in here. Yeah, Nemo, let me. I'm I, gonna I, take a pause, but um. Just because there's a, a nice little segue here. Um, so Diablo 4 came to Game Pass um, a few weeks ago, right? Mm -hmm. And it became one of the more popular. It's I think it's now the most popular vehicle for people to play Diablo. Okay. Nice. Awesome. Makes sense, right? The version of Diablo 4 now, when you launch it, you have the ability to skip the campaign from the first mm -hmm. get-go. Mm -hmm. um, which means you lose out on a lot of that. Uh, a lot of kind of what we've all talked about here today. It does, I, I believe, to skip it, I think you still, to skip and make a seasonal, I think you still have to go through the prologue, right? Yeah. Thoughts on the skip Maybe? campaign? Yeah, um, I mean, it breaks my heart, but it's it's like, it's a video game. Ultimately, at the end of the day, what's really important for all game developers, I think, like globally, is to generally respect the way that people want to play. And if you don't want to engage with the story, I don't want to force you to because you're not going to enjoy it. You're not going to have a good time. You want, if you want to just like kick demons in the balls, like that's why you bought Diablo Four. Especially if you're like your buddy told you pick the game up and we can like go kill some demons together. And you got to go through a story that you're not really engaged with. I would prefer you just play the game the way you want to play it and enjoy the experience. And then maybe later you try it. And maybe you like it. Um, it. It's really important to not like grab people's like head and like wrench them. Like the, the fun's over here. I promise you. Like the, the thing. <laughs> I think this is fun, and I made it to be fun. So you better freaking enjoy it. Um, because even if you were the kind of person who enjoyed that experience, you just hate it immediately when you're told to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, and this is this is one of those like ten pieces of tension as a game developer, especially a narratively focused game developer, is um, I care deeply about a lot of stuff that a lot of other people don't. And it's really important to understand my place in the hierarchy of the video game product as a, as a game. Uh, and like, I know that side quests aren't the most important part of the game to most people. I know that. I, ex I fully accept that, that that's not the thing that a lot of players come to. It, it, you take some soul searching to get there. Be and, and what makes it easier is knowing that there are tons of people out there that, that care so deeply, so deeply about that stuff. And it's for like, that's who I'm really doing it for, right? Um, but I also want to give people an opportunity to find out that they actually do love that stuff. So maybe a person who is just a grinder pops a quest one time. They're like, oh, you know what? This is really interesting. I'd like to like learn more about this. And then you sort of like engage on your own terms with content uh, that you might not otherwise dip toe into. So I understand completely why you they added it. It, it does break my heart a little bit, but I also respect that like the game's been out for X months. Most of the people that were, were going to play the campaign have probably already played the campaign, and the seasonal way to play is kind of the like expected way to play. Like we kind of want you to play seasonal, right? Um, so it it is, and on a, you know when I play seasonal, obviously I skip the campaign too because I've I've done it. I played the campaign. So if you play the campaign, I wouldn't want you to do it over and over again. So um, you're absolutely right, and it's it's a shame, but there's just a ton of people who don't prefer to play the game a certain way that is not my way to play the game and i i want to respect that and i think it's important to respect the player's time they bought the product they bought the game they spent their money on it they should be able to have the fun that they want to have with it was there any 
hawk like uh because we've had the ability to skip the campaign you know for a while um but you had to get through it first to, to actually do it was there any talk of that not being an option uh with like almost every other arpg on the market now you still have to engage with the campaign to get going um and in some ways like in the absence of it i've kind of wanted to go back to yeah. that i i, I yeah. don't know it, it, like it feels wrong not having that arrow to move you yeah right yeah I, I, I honestly aimless. no i agree i mean like it's it's my preferred way to level from one to 50 no question um but i think that there was i don't think there's ever and, I, and a lot of these discussions did not happen with me in the room um but i i from my understanding it was we were always going to have a skip campaign button because of the seasonal content, um, because it's a short period of time. You only have a couple of months to get through seasonal content, and if people like flame out trying to do the campaign, um, and just being like, "I've done the campaign already. I don't want to do it again," uh, and they they eject before they've even hit, because you have to do the campaign before you can do the seasonal stuff. Like you have to have it done. So if you want people to try the new fun stuff, or they're coming back and they haven't played for six months or whatever, you want to play season four, season five, and they really want to see what's new. If we force them to do the campaign, it's like I've already done all this. I want to see the new stuff, um, and it it just sours that experience before they even get to it. So I, I I again I can't speak with a ton of authority on this, but I I think it was always the case that we were going to let people skip the campaign eventually um, uh, once you've done it once because there's the seasonal content we really want to get you to to engage with. Totally logical, totally fair, and totally nine balls question. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I wish that I could have filled this one in when we were still like talking about Halazar. I just couldn't couldn't find like the proper segue in and stuff like that. <laughs> but like the the one last like burning question that I have is a as a necromancer main, you know, since uh, since uh, Diablo two, um, is Rathma's temple and Halazar like the sunken city, or is the sunken city located somewhere in Halazar? The sunken city. The so the sunk, the sunken city is the that's kind of like the the home base of the necromancer or the priests of Rathma. Are you talking about the necropolis? Yeah. Or well, uh, I, so it's because it, it was always referred to as just like the the necromancers operate out of the the sunken city, and it was mm. always referred to be like in the jungles and the swamps, right? Uh, east of east of uh, um, Kedjistan. Right. So it's like kind of like felt as if like it should be like in Halazar type area. Right, right. I hear you. So it is not the Necromancer headquarters. Um, right. What? So uh, it was always like a Rathma themed place. And I think there's like Necromancer themed banners and stuff floating in the water there. Um, yeah. I th the idea there was, I think the lore I came up with for that was that it was where potential of death speakers would go that's why i think it's called like temple of the death speaker um yeah. to like do like a final trial to be like are you worthy to be like the next death speaker um and i think i put that lore on a unique out like this again like you sneak lore in whenever you can find space space for it like i didn't have space to tell the story of the, the temple of the death speaker so i just like use the unique item to like speed that inf like sneak that information out um so it's not supposed to be their headquarters i think it's a place where like rathma long ago was like his sort of like his little fort hit like rathma's like private private zone mom keep out um and then i think at some point he stopped using it and it became repurposed as this sort of like trial zone for potential death speakers to sort of like see if they're worthy and and and, and strong enough to like inherit that mantle and then they would return to uh to their to the necropolis to like the the headquarters of the of the necromancers so um that wasn't at all intended to to make it sort of seem like that should be the where all like the necromancers hang out. Uh, but it's supposed to be sort of like a a branch office. Gotcha. Um, will we go there one day? I know you you don't work there anymore, but yeah. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. Who's to say? He's like, yes, uh, definitively. Maybe there's maybe. fun stuff that hit hiding in the jungles. No, there's Who's not. There's flares say? and fucking mosquitoes. They're not. That's fun. true. Yeah, they that's murder true. me. Yeah, uh, it's just it, it, it's just it, it, it'll be, it'll be shoots fun. the little wasps. It's the only monster in the in all of that area. Now, now we now we need a wasp that shoots undead flares. Yeah, okay, oh, digi doll okay. specifically. So they, yeah. they they do damage, and then when they explode, they do even more ridiculous. They do even more damage. damage. Oh yep, lord, that, that's bugged and has never been good. Task. And we can just Big we can just throw Iron Maiden back in too, and just make it completely busted. 
Um, it'd be a good time. Oblivion Knight just appears out of nowhere. Guess what you need? <laughs> I remember, I think I there was an early day where I had, had a unique item. I called like the, the Oblivion Knight sword or something like that because I was like, oh, that's a cool... I think so we cool. changed it. I think it was... It, 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 I changed it to something else that was that was more appropriate to like the story uh, that we were trying to tell at that point. But I, I remember for a hot cool, minute... Uh, uh, well, I don't disagree. But uh, it was... <laughs> I think I called it like... Oblivion Knight's Blade or something like that because I was like, oh, that's a, a memorable me- uh, enemy from from early Diablo. I tried to do as much of that with the uniques as I did. I basically stole unique item naming from like people. They're like, hey, can I name all the uniques because I love naming stuff and writing flavor text. And they're like, we don't have any time for any other writers to do it, so fine, do whatever, just go, man, just stop bothering us, please. And I would, every day I'd be like, please, can I like my nose against the glass? Like, can I do unique items? Uh, so I luckily got to like name all all the unique items and flavor them up through season three. Uh, because I just like nagged them enough to do it. And so that's where I <laughs> snuck in all my like like references to Mendel and references to like Jurits the Mighty and stuff like that. So the characters that we've like mentioned but never like knew anything about. Uh, it was like you trying to use the unique items to like fill in the empty spaces of the world's lore. Uh, just so you know, the first time the Ring of Mandel dropped in a game for me, I ran into the next room to yell at my girlfriend and my son. Oh my god! You should be- <laughs> yeah. And they were like, "What are you talking about?" I'm what like, is Never wrong mind. with you? Never are you mind. crazy? Yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. Um, well, actually, so I have a really hard-hitting journalistic question for you then. Shaco or Shaco? Oh God! Oh. <laughs> I don't. It's another one of those things where like it was never like spoken except by the fans or whatever. So I think Shaco it's Shaco to me forever. Is it Shaco? And that's what me. it is, man. Then that, that's <laughs> it's Shaco. <laughs> I appreciate the validation. It's not, it's not a leather cap. It's like a. It's like a totally different shape. If you look at what those actually are, they're completely different. Back in the day, I mean, they just picked any word that meant hat. We had that problem with D four too, where you're like, how many times can I use the word greaves? Like I've used tacits. I don't know tacits uh-huh. now. I like trying to look up new words for like arm armor, and you're like, I got nothing i'm out of ideas for this we'll just, we'll just call them slippers uh so trying to find words that like mean hat boy they really they really uh, pulled a deep deep cut with that one well i think as we're getting close to the end here and we are prolonging your dinner a right? little bit no, yeah, it's, fine. Fine. it's totally fine i'm having a great time no this is awesome um but we don't want to keep you too long uh Last questions. Anything left on your plate, gentlemen, that you have not asked Harrison? I've talked a lot, Nine. You got something? Yeah. No, no. <laughs> okay, well then uh, I got I got one. A, and this is a lot. A lot of the, a lot of the questions I actually came in with were more like technical uh, questions about like the the field and such, which just have, have been answered, yeah. you know, throughout the, uh, the the flow of the conversation and such. So. Yeah. No. Uh, well, then I'll I'll ask one. Um, you know, you, you spend a lot of time on the side quests and stuff, and, and like I said, I really appreciate uh, I really appreciate the, the discussion about like intentionality, like you're talking about. That means a lot to me and my work and what I do too. And, and so, I guess like with that in mind, like, do you have a favorite side quest that you designed, or that maybe someone else designed, or maybe like a favorite couple if you can't pick one? But yeah, uh, I would love. I'm gonna jot them down because I can go redo them real quick and just check them out. But I'm curious. Yeah, that's. I mean, like. Gosh, I have so uh, the heretic is definitely the 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 mm. most like close to home one. That was like the like very personal story uh, for me, um, and I was only also really happy with like using the mechanics to tell the story. Um, for example, like in the oh, in the first quest, you like pick flowers for this girl, and she's like all timid and stuff, and then. In the third quest, she's like ripping livers out of like dead corpses, yeah. and like it's yeah. just, it's supposed to mirror the first. It's like the same thing. Get three things, and she's like, "I'll do it. I, I could do it." And she's like putting her wrist into like corpses and ripping livers out and stuff. And it was just to show the growth that she had gone through, right? Um, so that kind of like, um, escaping from an abusive relationship while also trying to tell stories about like the witches and stuff, as I said earlier, is very personal to me. Um. I'm really proud. I'm really pleased with the reaction to the Sister Octavia quest line mm, um, that yeah. I did. Uh, the 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 exorcism quest. That was one that I'd done in a pre, like earlier version of the game. And I I told man I was really like sad to see that quest go into the garbage can. I was really proud of it. And I pitched it to the the zone supervisor of Fractured Peaks, and they were like, well, yeah, we're gonna put that back in. So I like snuck time to the side to make <laughs> to make that quest happen. Um, and then the animators gave me that great like coming like rising off the bed animation. Like they yeah. killed it. Like I was like, oh, I just need something to like make the kid look like he's floating. And they're like, what if we gave you a, a custom animation for the side quest? And I was like, incredible. Uh, awesome. So I was, and people really like Sister Octavia. Um, and again, yeah. like that quest was intended not just to be like a, a random exorcism quest, but it was like, hey, there are actually good people in the Cathedral of Light doing the best that they can 
under like a shitty kind of bureaucracy that doesn't care about them and yeah. will burn them at the stake in a, in a heartbeat. Uh, but they're trying to do good works and they really do believe they are true believers in the method, like the, like the message of the, of the church. Um, so I'm really happy. People seem to really like that one. I'm really, really happy about that one. Um, the Taisa quest uh, was another yeah. one that I, I originally she's given one of the to coolest other characters in D4. By the way, she's so I, cool. I love her. The way yeah. she fleshed out honestly shocked me because I yeah, expected her to be like a one-off, like something happens and then you just never think about her again. But the fact that she came back and like yeah. that whole yeah, that so was a really we were cool picking twist. Up, thank you so much. Yeah. So when we were talking about like major quest lines that we'd want to revisit, I immediately was like, well, I, I mean, like Taisa went through a horribly traumatic like. To be tattooed against your will is a very clear metaphor, right? Um, and it yeah. was like, we can't just, like, bad things happen in Diablo all the time, and then people just, like, dust themselves off and never talk about it again. And it's like, that's not how human beings react to trauma. Like, she went through something really serious, and I think it's really important for us as storytellers to, like, address that and not just be like, well, it's just video games. Who cares? Like, that really happened to a person, and it's really messed up. And if you've ever been through a traumatic incident, like, all of that line, again, like, was very similar to, like, my own experience is like working through things that I'm sure we've all worked through of like, you just keep thinking it's going to happen again. Like you just like every day you're like, Oh my God, it's happening again. Um, how do you escape that cycle of just like spinning yourself up? Um, and so originally I'd actually, I'd, I'd pass that quest off to other quest designers. Cause I, I, you know, like I have other quests to do and I felt there were other designers more, more appropriate for, for telling that story. Um, and just unfortunately with scheduling and sort of like staffing and stuff, it kind of fell back on my plate. So I, I did, I did like close it out. I didn't finish the whole thing, but I click, like closed that quest out with the, with the amulet, you know, with the, with the mm -hmm. inscription on the bottom and stuff. Um, and it was just, that was again, like a very personal story that I thought was really important to, especially one of our only like women of color characters to not just be like flippant about a horrible traumatic event that happened to them and like really unpack what, we're not really talking about other characters and all the NPCs that you help like are going through, but you can imagine now that they're all going through similar things yeah. uh, because we sort of like put that on the table of like, yeah, it's just trauma and it, you don't just walk away from it. Um, and then obviously the, the, uh, the by three, they come quest. Like that was my, yeah, no. the moment I was the zone supervisor of towers are, I put my thumb on the scale. I'm like, we're going to that dungeon. Like, I don't care what it takes yeah. day one. This was like years ago. I was like, when we we're, I want to find a spot. And I looked at the, the cinematic and it's like, I'm kind of like a flat marsh and there's like mountains behind it. So I'm like, well, it kind of makes sense to be in how are, but all the Northern borders are already taken up and stuff. So where can we find a spot for it? And all the artists and like dungeon designers were so excited. When I told them we were going to do that dungeon, they were like, they were like the engine started and everybody's like let's oh, cool. let's let's get the literal like 3d models from the actual cinematic and they like took those into the game and like simplified them down like those are the actual assets from the cinematic like simplified down and um i just love going to places in cinematics and video games like that's my favorite yeah. thing ever uh yeah. so i was just like i want to go there it's cool uh, and and I had a massive team of incredibly talented people, artists, designers, sound people, uh, uh, to like crank that out uh, and make that like really really memorable. So th those are the ones that I'm really the proudest of for sure. That's awesome. And yeah, that was an amazing find. Like just just derping around, right? Like preseason, season one hasn't started yet. Just going and doing every little quest, and then I went through my hardcore character and did all the little side quests again, just so I could get another round of them, right? And like. Uh, I remember I got I I hadn't done that on my main character because at the beginning of the game there were some like you know, you have the x of, x of out of x or whatever and there was like yeah. some quest you couldn't get to or like it was just it was it was displaying wrong. Um, yeah, you have to have finished the campaign beforehand because you can't because Elias has to be dead before yeah, you can so, like, yeah. change it. So no, you, I, right. I, you have to have finished the campaign first. Yeah. But yeah, when I finally came across that though, it was like, whoa, wait a minute, this is wait. And pulled the yeah, that, that dawning whoa, of like, whoa. wait a second, I know this place. Uh, this like the familiar. chapel, just like the exact chapel. You see the, the blood on the ground. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah. 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 So, the artist killed it. Yeah, super cool. And that, and again, and and I think that like it, it's a testament to the team, like you and, and the team, and what you guys, you know, the care you put in it. Um, there's so many moments like that in Diablo 4. That didn't exist in Diablo 3 or Diablo 2 yeah. or Diablo 1. Like a lot of that lore stuff we went and found in books and comic books and other things. Finding that in a Diablo game is the fucking coolest thing. So thank you. I'm really glad. No, that that means a lot because we we care so deeply. The team is care so deeply, and whenever they can find a moment to to pull out something that they really resonated with in a past Diablo game and like make the quest about that, knowing that someone else probably also resonated with it as well. Uh, it, it's like so important and it's tough because like we don't other than like meeting in person we don't get a chance to hear that stuff very often right like on the internet or social media you don't hear that stuff so every so often we will, like, people will go on reddit and be like look for like people talking about side quests and stuff which is few and far between but sometimes you see some people like hey what's your favorite quest and you can be like oh that thing i worked on so it's just really rare to actually get to hear 
that it matters to people. So I'm we're I'm really appreciative, and I know the team is really appreciative, uh, and they just they care so so much about Diablo, and they care so much about the story, and really making you feel like you're part of it. Um, it's it's one of the things that just drives the quest team. Like the quest team is just filled with incredibly talented, passionate storytellers, and all they want to do is do more like lore stuff and like expand on the lore and introduce new lore and uh give people that love that stuff a place to to really like find find the home you know awesome wow as i said before we've taken up a lot of your time <laughs> it's not worth we'll, that much we'll, we'll, <laughs> i i sincerely doubt that um <laughs> We'll still do post show conversation. That's that's just for all of us. Um, but we'll close it out as we always do with a uh, homage to the Tau level, which you can talk. I don't know about. what I don't know what it, what is a cow level. It's okay, fine. What is um, that? It sounds weird. <laughs> I had to do it at least. So we'll close it out as we always do with a moo 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 moo. Moo, 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 moo. Moo, 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 moo?